Assalamu alaikum. In Surah Al Adiyat, or the Surah termed the racing horses or the races, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first few ayahs of this Surah, He begins by painting a very vivid image of a group of horses. So Allah starts by saying, Wal Adiyati Wabha. He takes an oath. So the wa, the wa in the beginning of this surah is an oath. And we talked about oaths before. So just a quick recap. Um, that in the Arabic language, oaths are taken to emphasize the truth of something that's about to be said. So you might say, Wallahi, you know, I didn't say that the other day. So by saying Wallahi, swearing by Allah or taking an oath by Allah, believe my statement that I've, I didn't do that the other day or I didn't say what, you, what you're accusing me of saying. So the function of the oath, number one, to kind of emphasize something is true. But number two, the thing you take an oath upon. So when we say, Wallahi, I take an oath by Allah. Allah takes an oath by His creation. Whether it's a trees or uh, horses or anything in His creation. And He selects a type of creation that, that has a link to what He's about to say. Um, or He selects a type of creation to magnify and, and to kind of to point towards Him. That this is what I've created and to draw attention to that that created being um, and there are other other functions literally um, and rhetorically of oaths so here Allah takes an oath by a group of horses and why he's taking the, uh, these oaths is to make a statement that indeed a hu the human being is ungrateful to his Lord ungrateful to his master and we'll see what's the link between the horses and that conclusion that response that statement the the, the thing he's trying to prove to be true What's the link between the two? We'll have a look at that later, inshallah. So to start with, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَ By the racing, the racing horses that are panting. ضَبْحَ is, is the sound a horse makes when it's running really fast. Uh, you, know, you know, it's panting, it's breathing very heavily. فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَدْحَ مُورِيَاتِ قَدْحَ refers to, just imagine horses that are going so fast that when their hooves kind of touch the ground, it, it sparks, sparks come out of that, that, that touch. That's how fast they're running. That's how intensely they're running. فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ uh, subha, Horses that attack at dawn. They're charging in to attack at dawn. So why, why specifically dawn is because the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah, his, his practice was, if he was ever engaged in warfare with an enemy, an attacking enemy, and defending against an enemy, um, he would he would make his move at dawn, early in the morning, and he says in the famous hadith, "Buri kali ummati fi bukuriha." My my ummah, my people, Muslims, will have a special blessing in the early hours. And then the continuation of the hadith is that whenever he would leave the house, or whenever he would go out for an expedition, he would leave in the early morning. So these horses are attacking in the early morning. فالمغيرات صبحا فأثرنا به نقعا by attacking in the early morning, there's clouds of dust surrounding them. So, so the, the Allah is describing these horses, and they're clearly battle horses. They're not any normal horses. They're clearly very fearsome. They're sparking hooves and, and clouds of dust. There's this aura around them. فَوَسَطْنَا بِهِ جَمْعًا they, they penetrate into the heart of, of enemy lines, into the center. Uh, that's وَسَط, to do to the center or, or the heart of something. And then, so these first five ayahs, Allah is describing these battle horses. They're charging, they're penetrating the center of an enemy. And the Sheikh Salih al usaymi mentions that this kind of, this example, this image, this oath is taken to kind of make the listener fear. Who are these battle horses? Um, because, you know, at the time, um, if, if this surah is a, taken according to some scholars as a Madani surah, a Medinan surah, in the early times, in the early kind of years of Medina, uh, the Muslims were still in a weak position, uh, you know, they didn't have huge numbers, they didn't have a huge army, and you know, they constantly had threats of violence, of attack from neighboring tribes, from the Meccans, and so in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts fear into the hearts of those who, who think Islam is in a vulnerable position, good time to strike, Allah takes an oath by these horses, these battle horses, which are his creation, which are very capable of defending and, and attacking and, and kind of uh, protecting the Muslims. And so it's to kind of make people a little bit frightened and draw their attention into this creation of Allah, this, these horses, these battle horses, and their extraordinary capabilities. Um, and to also basically to not mess with the Muslims. 
Allah is describing these battle horses of the Muslims that are so well trained and, and can really do a good job. So be careful. Beware you're, you're dealing with people who are trained. Don't think they're vulnerable people just because they're Muslims, just because they're minorities, just because they're weak. Um, so this is, this is a meaning Sheikh Saleh al usaymi the, the author, supports this, this tafsir. Once that image is, is kind of, Allah described it in so much detail, and you know, the Arab, the non-Muslim, the, is listening, and you know, the Arabs were very kind of attached to their horses. And, you know, the horse is the symbol of bravery, of Arabness, of masculinity. Um, it's, it's a symbol of the Arabs. Uh, you know, there's the famous line of poetry from an Arab poet, Al-Mutanabbi. Um, you know, he describes the sword and the horse, kind of, these are the things that occupy me. And I can't remember the, the line of poetry at the moment. But, so it's a, very, it's a symbol of this bravery of, and, of Arab pride. And so the Arabs are listening to this. And all of a sudden, once they're drawn into this imagery of this horse, and now, remember the horse is, um, a, you, you know, the Arab um, horseman is usually an owner over the horse, right? The horse is his, kind of, he tames it, he trains it, he cultivates it, he nurtures it. Right? He's very proud of this, this beast he's nurtured, he's tamed, he's trained. So this is what's in the mind of the listener and then Allah mentions the conclusion, the response, the jawab al-qasam. So why did he take an oath? To make the statement. He's about to make the statement. He's about to prove the statement. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودِ That the human being or human beings are ungrateful to their master. So you know the, the listener is thinking about the horse as, as their kind of slave, their, their domestic object, their, their ownership. And they're the master of the horse. Now Allah flips the table. Inna insana li rabbihi the human being is ungrateful to his master. Uh, you know, you give a horse a tiny bit of water, a little bit of grass, or some food, and they're, they're grateful. You can tell they're excited because it's you're only giving them very little. But the human being, no matter how much you give them, they can be they can continuously be ungrateful. And this idea of being in al insan li la kanud. Kanud is is a word not for, not usually used in the Quran. You know, it's, it's referring to a specific type of ingratitude and not being grateful to Allah is of many levels. Um, you know, what is gratitude to Allah? How can we express our gratitude to Allah? You know, obviously, the, the, lowest, the lowest or kind of the worst is if we completely reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entirely and worship other than, others than Allah or disbelieve in Him. That's the biggest form of ingratitude, of being not thankful. You know, a step above that is, I believe in Allah, I worship Him, I acknowledge His blessings. But sometimes I forget about them, or I forget that really that these are not mine and Allah has given them to me, He's, he's gifted them to me. It's this ghafla, this heedlessness, this kind of, I'm in another world, I'm not conscious of the blessings. And then kind of a level higher than that is, okay, yes, I'm conscious of the blessings, but I'm not using them for what they were supposed to be used. I'm not using them to worship Allah or to please Him, I'm using them for other things. So money, for example, wealth. You know, it's supposed to be used to spend on, on family, to spend on the poor, to spend on ourselves and clothe ourselves. But if all that money is just hoarded and invested and we don't spend it on our family, we don't spend it for the poor, is that blessing of Allah being used as He asks us to use it? No. So that's a form of ingratitude. Yes, I'm conscious of my money. I know it's a blessing from Allah. But I'm not using that ni'mah, that blessing, the way it's meant to be used. This is a form of ingratitude. So in al insana, all human beings, to some extent, fit into one of these categories. لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودِ وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدِ And then Allah says that the human being is knowledgeable. He knows. He knows that he's ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The human being is aware of himself. Um, and probably a worse situation is if we're ungrateful and we don't know. Um, you know, what could be worse than we have a sin or we, ha we have a, bl a blind spot? We don't know that this is something that we do. Whereas to know about your weaknesses is even better. It's a higher station. Uh, so Allah says, وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ He is fully aware of his kufran, of his of kind of rejection and, and ingratitude. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ And why is that the case? One of the contributing factors, one of the reasons we kind of, kind of ignore or are heedless of Allah's blessings is that is our occupation, our obsession with wealth. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ He is in, intensely in love with wealth. And Allah here, He calls wealth Al-Khayr. Now Al-Khayr in Arabic is the word you use for anything good. Um, and, and in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah uses the word Khayr similarly for wealth to talk about money. But money isn't always good. 
you know, wealth is good if used in the right way, if, if earned in the right way and spent in the right way. Because you, you may earn your money in a halal way, but you may spend it in a haram way. Or you may spend it in a halal way. You know, I only eat halal meat or I only wear, you know, I only go to Umrah on holiday. But at the same time, I'm, I'm working in a job which, where I'm involved in oppressing others or I'm involved in interest-related loans or something haram. There's a haram element in my work. Um, so that khayr, that mal, that, that thing that, obsessive, that we're obsessed with, is what takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is what makes us ungrateful of Him. Um, because we, it's not about the money, but it's about what it creates, the greed it creates inside us. This shadid, this kind of intense obsession with wealth. Um, this kind of idea that you know anything good you want in this life, we need wealth for it. And so we stop wanting those things, whether it's freedom or happiness or contentment or a good family or transport. We stop wanting those objectives and we become obsessed with the the, what can help us get those objectives, which is the money itself. We get obsessed with the, with the stepping stone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it's not this, this money. You know, you can have, for example, you can have a million pounds in your account. And, you know, after Brexit or after some kind of major economic collapse, your, the pound can drop in value so, so much that your money can mean nothing. You know, we know that not, not many years ago, the Turkish lira as a currency, they were trading in the millions, so like, you know, a million lira was equivalent to a pound. Um, you know, there are countries like Zimbabwe, other, other countries where the currency is inflated so much, it's actually worth nothing. You know, so that, that thing that we become obsessed with, what happens when some international incident happens and that's not worth anything anymore? You know, it, it's not, it just doesn't have its value anymore. So why would we be obsessed with something that fluctuates, something that doesn't have its own value? And Allah assigns it a value. Its value is, is how much we give value to it. It's, uh, we get obsessed with it. Uh, and so this is the point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes. And He links it. And its link, its connection with the oath about the horses and the way they attack is similar to money. The horses, was, horses were also a, a big passion project, a big hobby for Arabs. They expensive. They were expensive to obtain. It's even today, you can go in the, the hundreds of thousands or the tens of thousands of dollars and pounds to buy, buy an expensive an Arabian horse. Um, and so this intense passion for hobbies and wealth and these kind of distractions is what makes us kanood, makes us ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the conclusion of Surah uh, Adiyat, so the first part of Surah Al-Adiyat is the, the oath of the horses, then the response to that oath, the conclusion, the, the truth statement, which is that the human being is ungrateful to Allah. And now finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once he states that statement, human beings are ungrateful to Allah for these reasons and these reasons. Allah's conclusion then hammers down. Does this ungrateful human being not know what will happen when the contents of graves are spilled out? Mu'thira. You know, it's, it's kind of like, it comes out in a chaotic way. It's, it's, it just, it's uncovered. Meaning the human bodies, when human bodies come out of their graves, and that is referring to the Day of Judgment. Similar to the previous ayah, and this is what it has in common with the previous surah, uh, Surah Az-Zilzal. وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And the contents of their chests are kind of uncovered, they come out. You know, and, and that is a, that image, the things hidden in the chest, Allah mentions it in the Qur'an and other places. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ Allah knows the sneaky glance of the eye and what the chests are hiding. This idea of the chests are hiding is, is, is the secrets. You know, when, when, we, when we keep something to ourselves, it's, we kind of like bury it in our chests. We don't let it come out either from our mouths, ears or eyes. They stay suppressed. But there is a day in which all secret, secrets will be laid bare. They will come out. We can't hide. وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ Allah says, their master, بِهِمْ With them, or in regards to them, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ On that day, لَخَبِيرِ He's fully aware. He knows everything. He's fully informed of what they're doing and, 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 and their ingratitude to him and how they spend their life. He's fully informed on that day. And these three ayahs are a, a kind of revelation to the person who's ungrateful. Either an extreme ungratefulness, which his ingratitude takes him to just to shirk billah, to disbelieve in Allah or to worship other than him. 
or a lighter form of ingratitude where you know he worships Allah he knows the blessings but he's not really grateful for them he doesn't really use those blessings in the right way wherever he is on the spectrum of being ungrateful to Allah all of the all those everyone all of us need that same reminder which is remember the day in which your secret, secrets will be laid bare the things you hid you know the, the ta- those times you use Allah's blessings your hands for example to do things that were uh, you know, you you did you secretly did things that were wrong. You know that secret message that you sent, the, the, that 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 thing you looked at with your eyes secretly when nobody was looking. The the idea of the the, the day of judgment being the embarrassing day when secrets would be would be pulled out. You know, we all hate for our private moments to be exposed. We all hate for our private flaws, our secrets to be to come out. Because they show, they, they kind of, there's, there's nowhere to hide them. There's no mask. You can't pretend to be someone else. There's no Facebook profile that's going to save you from the true reality of who you are coming out on that day. And then Allah mentions that their master. He's talking about them with the third person, their master. Um, on that day, will be fully aware of what they do. Now, why did Allah say Allah is fully aware only on that day? When Allah is fully aware of what we do all the time, why did He specify the Day of Judgment? Um, and it's because on that day, He will reward them or recompensate them for their actions. That's what He means by that. He, he's fully aware and on that day, He will take the knowledge that He has and the information He has about them and He will give them their reward or their compensation for what they did in this world. Some points to reflect from this surah, from Surah Adiyat. Um, the first point to reflect on is, is, uh, is things that we hold dear, whether it's wealth or it's horses or whatever it is. How much are these things, how much, how much are we attached to these things emotionally to the extent that if they were taken away, um, we would be d- distressed. We would be uh, kind of feel you know, upset with Allah or angry with Allah. How, how often do we let ingratitude, being ungrateful to Allah, slip into our actions, slip into our days, into our mouths? And in what form does that ingratitude take? Because everyone is ungrateful in a different way. And then lastly, what is the, the solution for being ungrateful to Allah is to remember. Is to remember that there will be a day in which we will be counted. Those blessings will be counted and our responses will be counted. And that if we use those blessings that Allah gave us for something secret and untoward, something you know under the hood, something underworld, on that day, it will spill out. That's a day where none of us can hide. And, and coming to terms with that is, is something we should all reflect on deeply.